Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Real Engineering, where we look at movies and TV shows with both surprisingly good and laughably bad depictions of engineering. Today, we're looking at the 1951 film No Highway in the Sky, based on the novel No Highway by British author Neville Shute, and starring Jimmy Stewart, Marlena Dietrich, Linus Johns, and Jack Hawkins. The plot revolves around Theodora Honey, an eccentric metallurgist just working for the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough. In the course of his research, Honey comes to an alarming conclusion regarding a brand new airliner, the Rutland Reindeer. He determines that after around 1400 flying hours, vibration will cause the tail spar to fail due to metal fatigue. When the prototype reindeer crashes in Labrador and the tail is found to be missing from the wreckage, Honey is dispatched to the crash site to aid in the investigation. Halfway across the Atlantic, Honey discovers to his horror that he is flying aboard the second reindeer prototype, whose flying hours are very near the failure limit. He informs the crew that the tail could fail at any minute, and while at first they are skeptical, they agree to shut down the inboard engines to break up the vibration and radio London for advice. Honey grows increasingly agitated and tries to convince the crew and passengers to turn the aircraft around, but having passed the midway point, the captain decides to press on to Gander. After landing without incident in Gander, the captain orders Honey locked away while he has a complete inspection performed on the aircraft. When the inspection turns up nothing, the captain prepares to reboard the passengers and carry on to Montreal, but at the last minute, Honey rushes into the cockpit and collapses the landing gear, grounding the plane. Back in England, the incident causes a major scandal. While Honey's boss, erring on the side of caution, orders the static vibration test to be continued, the RAE calls for the reindeer's immediate return to service to alleviate public fears regarding the safety of British aircraft. Meanwhile, Honey is subjected to psychiatric tests and prepares to be scapegoated for the whole affair. And as the vibration tests push well past the 1400-hour mark without incident, it appears as though Honey's calculations were incorrect after all. But suddenly, word arrives that the repaired Gander aircraft's tail failed following a short test flight, and moments later the static test article fails as well. Honey spots a thermometer and realizes that he didn't correct for temperature, accounting for the longer time to failure. In addition to its solid footing in actual engineering, a result of author Neville Shute having been an engineer for Vickers Armstrong, one of the most admirable aspects of No Highway in the Sky is that it doesn't rely on lazy characterization or contrivances to build drama. There are no unreasonably obstructive authority figures. Though the airliner crew and the RAE are at first understandably skeptical of Honey's theories, they always take his concerns seriously and take every reasonable precaution to ensure the safety of the passengers. Only when every option has been exhausted and still no evidence for Honey's theory emerges do they finally turn against him, and even then many of the characters continue to support him as best they can throughout the film. One weakness of the film is its slow pace and its excessive focus on Honey's home life and eccentricities, which make it less of a thriller than its marketing would suggest. Nonetheless, the performances are solid throughout, especially by Stewart and Glynis Johns as sympathetic stewardess Marjorie Corder, and the film is a great treat for aviation enthusiasts, featuring cameo appearances by several classic British aircraft including the de Havilland Vampire, Ever Lancaster, and the Gloucester E-144 prototype fighter. But by far the most fascinating aspect of No Highway in the Sky is how it predicted a future disaster with eerie accuracy. On May 2, 1952, a de Havilland DH-106 Comet, registration GALYP, took off from London bound for Johannesburg, becoming the first jet airliner to carry fare-paying passengers. Entering service a full six years ahead of the American Boeing 707, the Comet seemed poised to grant post-war Britain commercial dominance of the skies. But this early promise was to be short-lived. On January 10, 1954, BOAC Comet GALYP crashed into the Mediterranean en route from Rome to Singapore, killing all 35 aboard. While an official inquiry was launched, the government, wary of tarnishing the British aerospace industry's prestige, pressured the investigation committee to end their inquiry without drawing any official conclusions and return the comet to service. On April 8th, however, Comet GALYY of South African Airways crashed en route from Rome to Cairo, under suspiciously similar circumstances, killing 21. This crash finally resulted in the whole comet fleet being grounded and a thorough investigation being launched. Upon recovery and examination of the wreckage, it was determined that the likely culprit was metal fatigue. 
Fatigue occurs when metal is subjected to cyclic loading, which causes small fatigue cracks within its structure to form and grow. Once these cracks reach a critical size exceeding the fracture toughness of the component, it will suddenly and catastrophically fail. In the case of the comet, the cyclic loading of the airframe was caused by the constant pressurization and depressurization of the fuselage as the aircraft gained and lost altitude. As the comet climbed and flew faster than any previous airliner, it was subjected to larger and more frequent pressurization cycles, shortening the time to failure. To test the metal fatigue theory, the RAA built a giant water tank at Farnborough in which they immersed the fuselage of Comet GALYU. By continuously pumping water in and out of the fuselage, the RAE engineers were able to simulate the pressurization loading on a much compressed timescale. On June 24, 1954, after 3,057 pressurization cycles, the fuselage finally ruptured around the forward left escape hatch, a failure consistent with the recovered wreckage of the crashed comets. Further investigation revealed that the failure was further accelerated by the square corners of the comet's windows and escape hatches which induced stress concentrations and exacerbated fatigue crack growth. Based on these findings, the comet was redesigned with rounded windows, thicker gauge skin, and ripstop doublers to help contain crack propagation. The improved Comet 4 re-entered service with BOAC in September 1958, but it was already too late. The newly introduced American jetliners, the Boeing 707 and Douglas DC-8, were far superior in capacity, performance, and cost-effectiveness, and only a handful of airlines other than BOC operated the Comet until the type was largely retired in 1965. Britain would never again enjoy the brief aviation supremacy it enjoyed in the heady days of 1952 and 1953. Thank you for watching, and see you next time on another episode of Real Engineering, only on our own devices.